one of the defining characteristics about this moment in our history is that we are generating enormous amounts of information about absolutely anything and everything that can be measured, about our social networks, our governments, our bodies, and our universe. And from all this information, we're really hoping to answer some of our most pressing questions. Answers that we typically tend to seek by reducing these massive complex data sets down to more manageable and smaller amounts of information. But this reduction strips away much of the richness of that original data. Take, for example, the popular college rankings that are published each year in the US News and World Report. Now, these rankings are based on loads of information that's collected from colleges and universities all across America. Information like test scores of incoming freshmen, student to teacher ratios, and even professors' salaries. Now, all this information is fed into a numerical model that then spits out a ranked ordered list of schools. A couple of weeks ago, I was reading a piece in The New Yorker by Malcolm Gladwell, who's an author that was actually raised here in the Waterloo region. And in his piece, Gladwell was taking a critical look at this ranking system. And in particular, he pointed out two universities that were given nearly identical scores. One of these is a large public university with a nationally ranked football team and situated in rural Pennsylvania, while the other is a small, private religious school in the heart of Manhattan with separate campuses for men and women. Now, by most measures, the educational experiences of students at these two universities couldn't be more different. And yet, this ranking system uh, rated those two systems uh, nearly the same. And the problem is really that the numerical model that created these rankings inherently takes a specific ideological standpoint about which aspects of that collected data is most important. Now, in the sciences today, access to cheap, fast technology has led to unprecedented amounts of information and absolutely breathtaking advances in knowledge. In biology, the transition to a data-intensive science has been absolutely stunning. Just two weeks ago, we celebrated the 10-year uh, the anniversary of the sequencing of the human genome, a feat that itself took 10 years and at a cost of $3 billion. But now, for 5,000 bucks, you can sequence a genome in less than a day. But biologists aren't just interested in DNA. They're conducting experiments and collecting data about loads of other things, like chemical reactions that occur in our cells which genes are turned on and off under different experimental conditions, and massive amounts of information related to clinical and long-term outcomes. In short, they're creating large, complex data sets. Now, this flood of information has fundamentally tied biology to statistics and has given rise to the new field of computational biology. Experts working in this field apply sophisticated statistical methods to biological data in order to understand how our bodies work at a molecular level. But just like that college ranking system, these statistics are stripping away much of the richness of that original data. A simple uh, example of this is Anscombe's Quartet, which was created by the statistician F.J. Anscombe in the 1970s. Now, these four sets of numbers have the exact same mean, correlation, and variance. So according to these simple statistical measures, they are equivalent. And yet, when we look at this data, we see very different stories. We see a weak correlation, outliers, and a nonlinear relationship. We can see this information that was hidden in those statistical measures. Now, Anscombe created this quartet to illustrate the importance of visualizing data before analyzing it. Now, the power of visualization comes from harnessing our perceptual system in order to free up our cognition for higher level tasks. So for example, looking at this string of letters, if I were to ask you to count the number of times you see the letter V, how hard do you have to work? But if I instead show it to you like this, the answer is immediately obvious. Our eyes are just drawn to those red letters. But with advances in computing power, we're no longer just limited to static images. And creating visualization tools that allow people to explore their data can, provides an immense amount of sense making. Now, in my own research, I develop interactive visualization systems that allow scientists to interact with their data and to make discoveries that might otherwise be hidden in the results of statistical methods. Um, I have found that by just providing interactivity, 
I can increase my collaborator's understanding by orders of magnitude. I'm going to illustrate this with uh, some visualizations from a group I work with at the Harvard Medical School who study fruit flies. Now, these images are how this group was looking at their data when I first started working with them. So on the left, each of the data points plotted in that black square represents a cell in a fruit fly embryo. And on the right, we see information about which genes are turned on and off in each one of those cells. Now, these two views are linked together with shape and color. So for example, the blue circles are linked to the column of data with the label B circle. But what the scientists can't, couldn't do from these static images is actually know which strip of data in that column corresponded to a specific blue circle on the left. So the first prototype that I developed for them took the visual conventions that they were using and, and uh, added the ability to select a single cell and see that cell's gene information on the right. Using this prototype, this group was able to explore their data on a cell-by-cell -cell basis for the very first time, and they made numerous insights into the computational methods that they were using. Now, I've worked with this group for two years, and the final tool I developed for them, shown here, is called Multisum. Um, from that initial prototype, I applied known visualization principles to the encodings, and also created a general framework that allowed them to explore computational results along with the underlying raw data. Multisum is now one of the primary analysis tools used by this group as they start to untangle some of the mysteries around fruit flies, mysteries that have implications for our understanding of human disease. Now, one thing I want to stress is that I'm an engineer, and I take a systematic approach to visualization design. My designs are meant to present information in a clear, accurate, and intuitive way to enable rich and complex data analysis. And as an engineer, I rely on principles and rules to build things. And it turns out we know a lot about how to design visual representations in a principled way. A lot of the early visualization research uh, focused on fundamental visual encoding channels. So for example, here I'm showing you the basic channels we have for encoding numbers. Now these early researchers also conducted controlled laboratory experiments to understand which type of channels are easiest for us to interpret. So it turns out that color is hardest for us to interpret numbers, while spatial encodings is easier. I'm going to drive this point home starting here. This visualization is called a heat map. And it is perhaps one of the most widely used visualizations in biology today. In this image, quantitative values are encoded with color, where green indicates low values and red high values. Now, each one of these strips, each one of these seven strips is encoding a value that changes over time. So looking at this image, can you tell which of these strips contain peaks or valleys? Or even which ones are changing over time in a similar way? If instead we look at this data using a spatial encoding, where now values are encoded as position along the vertical axis, the nuanced characteristics of the data is much more uh, clear. Translating changes in position is more natural than translating changes in color. But visualization isn't just a set of techniques. It's a process. It's a process that has distinct stages that help guide the development of visualization tools. And the process that I use emphasizes the need to work closely with my users to ensure that the designs I create for them are effective for helping them answer their specific questions. Now, reality is always much, much messier than theory. And this is probably a more honest portrayal of how I actually work. But in all of this mess, there's one particularly critical step, and that's translate. This step is about translating the language of biology into the language of information visualization. And it's absolutely critical to get this step right, because no amount of brilliant design can overcome designing for the wrong thing. For me, this is the most challenging step and where I spend most of my time. To get my translations correct, I work hard to get into the heads of my collaborators and to really see the data as they do. I spend most of my days in biology labs across Boston, and I've even learned a few experimental techniques along the way. And while I wouldn't trust myself to pipette anything of importance, these experiences have really helped me to better understand the intuitions of my collaborators, intuitions that I then feed back into my designs. Now, what specifically do my collaborators get from these visualizations? Well, they're able to find errors and noise in their data, 
they get new ideas from more informative, more informative statistical methods, and they make discoveries that lead to new hypotheses and experiments. I'm going to briefly tell you about the experiences of a computational biologist I work with who's developing algorithms to compare the genomes of different species. Uh, we worked together to design a tool called MISBE to help him explore his results. So what I'm showing you here is the very first data set he loaded into MISBE. What he told me when he saw this was that he was really surprised and very disappointed. Now, he was disappointed because he actually had no idea. His algorithm was producing data with so much noise, but data that was so cluttered and messy. So he spent a couple of weeks tweaking parameters in his algorithm, and he was able to get this far. At this point, he decided to take a completely different approach. He developed a brand new algorithm, and that algorithm gave him this data set. Now, just last year, he published a paper on this algorithm, and he's released his software into the scientific community. I asked him how long would it have taken him to make this breakthrough using the methods to look at the data he was using prior to MISB. He told me he didn't think he would have even thought to try a new um, approach, as he had no idea just how messy that original data was. So currently, he's using this algorithm along with MISB to try to understand the genomic origins of species adaptation. Now, from these collaborations, I've come to learn that interdisciplinary research is absolutely critical for scientific discovery today. And I've also come to appreciate just how hard it is to do. That it requires skills that aren't taught in scientific and engineering domains. It requires things like empathy and curiosity, trustworthiness, and a willingness to learn about a new field. Now, I absolutely love what I do because it lets me do a little bit of a lot of things. Visualization is a young and vibrant field that links together computing, design, science, and humanism. And it is vital to our understanding of biology and of science and of the whole world around us. This is the future of discovery. Thank you.